Good morning. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. I'm going to start with our call to worship this morning, found in Psalm, in Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. What a great reminder of encouragement that is, that we are called to praise God all the time, regardless of what's happened this week, whether it's been a great week or a hard week. Our call and our reminder is to still come together and to praise our God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that regardless of the storms of life or the great times in life, we get to come to you and to praise you. And so today as we gather, whether we're gathering in person or online, in our homes, with our families, by ourselves, wherever it is that we are gathering, Lord, may we gather together and praise you, our God, every day of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
empty me out Fill me with you Lord, there is nothing I can give to you I lay down my life Here at your feet You give me life So completely I I died with you Was buried with you The moment I believed I I rose with you Ascended with you Into the heavenly Lord, it's not me, it's you inside of me. Jesus, your own, these eyes can see. Yeah. Empty me out, fill me with you. Lord, there is. I can give to you I lay down my life Here at your feet You give me life So completely I, I died with you Was buried with you The moment I believed and I, I rose with you, ascended with you into the heavenlies. Oh, and I, I died with you, was buried with you the moment I believed. Oh, and I, I rose with you, ascended with you into the heavenlies. Oh, Lord, it's not me. Side of me, Jesus, your own. These eyes can see. Oh Lord, it's not me, it's you inside of me. Oh Jesus, your own. These eyes can see. died with you, was buried with you, the moment I believed, Lord, I, I rose with you, ascended with you into the heavenly. Good morning, Bedford Community Church. I'm Jalissa, and today we have a couple of special announcements from our Children's Discipleship Director, Miss Melissa. August is coming up fast, and you know what that means. And if you don't know what that means, you need to pay more attention to your email and these announcements. It's VBS, VBS, VBS. Our worship team is practicing every week and we're excited because in addition, Heather Zimmer and Jessica Frey, we have six youth members who will be leading worship for us. Decorations are popping up all over the church because I'm running out of places to store them. Bags are being packed and train cars are ready. So we're ready to reach out to the kids of our community and share the love of Jesus with them. It's our biggest outreach of the year. But we need you, we need volunteers. I need you to sign up, the link is below, and we're doing VBS a little bit differently this year, so there is some training required to participate. The entire congregation of BCC, I need you to invite people to VBS. This is a mission field in your own community. The Great Commission says to go and make disciples of all the world. Notice there's no age limit on that. Disciples only if they're over 13, no. So this counts. Parents, sign up your kids for camp. The deadline is August 6th. 
No registrations will be accepted after this and I have found a fun yet annoying way to help you remember. August 6th, August 6th, August 6th, August 6th. So thank you. Hey everybody, we have some Sunday school changes. Starting in August, we're gonna change our Sunday school format. The elementary classes will be taking a break from August 1st to September 5th. They will be in service with their families. Nursery and preschool classes will still be meeting August 1st, August 8th, and August 15th. These classes will take their break from August 22nd to September 5th. During this time, we will be giving our volunteers a much needed break, readying our classrooms for the fall, recruiting and training all of our volunteers. While in Children's Discipleship, we play games, we do messy crafts, and we have fun, the heart of this ministry is telling kids about God, answering their questions, and helping them encounter God for themselves. If you would like to be a part of this amazing team, please contact me at melissa at bedfordcommunitychurch.org. Thanks, Ms. Melissa. We're so excited for VBS. Here at BCC, we have four ways to give online at bedfordcommunitychurch.org, on our Tithely app, through the mail, and in person when you attend services. We are so grateful for you and so glad that you decided to join us this morning. Enjoy the service. Good morning, BCC and all who are joining us. Welcome back to the last week of our sermon series, Out of Office, the Bible's prescription for R&R. Last week, Pastor Josh talked about our spiritual colic and how learning from David, who was simple, still, and secure, can help us deal with the discomfort of our own spiritual colic. This week, we're going to look at the idea of softening. You see, softening is seen as the fourth boundary that helps us to live the full life that Christ has for us to live, but it also results from the other three boundaries. Once we've learned the boundary of stop, the rhythm of Sabbath, the regular consistent change of pace, the dedication of the time of rest that we give to God, once we find ourselves sitting in his presence and learning to gaze at him in awe of who he is and what he's created, when we've allowed our spiritual colic to be treated by leaning in and learning to be still before God, then we can experience the heart change and the softening that God intends for us to experience. This softening, this, this heart change that God wants to manifest in our life can only happen when we stop, sit, and learn to be still. There's no shame in needing a softening of our hearts. In fact, almost all of us need a softening at some point, if not at multiple points throughout our lives. And today we'll look at why and how God accomplishes this incredible act of softening our hearts of stone. Will you turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 24. We're going to read through 28, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Will you pray with me? Father Almighty God, we thank you so much. We thank you that we have this opportunity to come and to dig into your text today. Lord, we thank you that we have looked at these boundaries of stopping and sitting and being still. And today, as we come before you, Lord, would you show us the areas in which our heart has become a heart of stone? Lord, would you show us areas in which you desire to soften our heart or maybe even replace it altogether? Lord, we desire to have hearts that are softened because, Lord, we want all that you have for us. And we know that it's in these boundaries that we can receive the fullness of life that you have for us. So, Lord, we turn ourselves over to you and to the work of your Spirit in our lives. 
Lord, would you illuminate for us in your text what it is that you have for us. Teach us your wisdom, Lord. We ask that today in Jesus' name. Amen. The heart. Who knows it? This heart, created by God, can feel the pains of life, that can enjoy the joys of hope, the one area of the body that has the ability to express both love and hate. The heart was developed for the sole purpose of God's plan. We can't forget that this heart of ours is commanded by God to do probably one of the most difficult things that we don't want to do at times of disappointment, at times of trial, at times of loss, at times of betrayal, and that is to forgive, to trust, and to above all, love. In scripture, we're called to love one another, even those whom we might label as our enemies. However, there is truth to be recognized, a truth we need to acknowledge, and that is this, that sometimes you might need God to give you a new heart. We might need our hearts to be softened, Sure, our hearts might not be fully stopped or stone cold, but it also might not be fully alive and vibrant. And who wants to live with something that is half dead? Even if it's still half alive, it's still half dead. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell our hearts to beat again. Let me share with you a true story. There's a pastor in Ohio who asked a member of his church who was a surgeon if he could be in the operating room to watch an open heart surgery. The doctor permitted him to observe and the physician began the surgery. He removed the woman's heart, repaired what was wrong and placed the heart back into her chest. And as he massaged her heart to get it going, it just wouldn't beat. He tried everything to start it using other procedures, but nothing worked. And in an act of desperation, the surgeon knelt down beside his patient and said, Mrs. Johnson, this is your surgeon. The operation went perfectly and your heart has been repaired, but you need to tell your heart to beat again. And when he finished saying those words, immediately her heart began beating. Even though the surgeon did everything necessary to repair her heart, the patient needed to cooperate with him. By an act of her will, she had to start her own heart beating. And this story inspired singer Randy Phillips to write the song, Tell Your Heart to Beat Again. You see, maybe you've been rejected. Maybe you've lost a loved one and your heart has stopped beating. Perhaps your spouse betrayed you and your heart no longer beats. You've lost hope and your will to live. Maybe life has just distracted you. You no longer remember the things that once brought you joy or delight. You no longer have the patience for the things you once declared that you would always love. Remember, God is the great physician who can repair your heart. But you and I, we have to tell our heart to beat again. We must tell our heart to love again. We must command our heart to hope again. Just tell our heart to beat. God can replace our heart and will, but our participation, our willingness to engage in the process matters. Our willingness to stop, to sit, to be still and allow the Lord to soften our heart is what will allow the great physician to do what he does best, to fix the heart that doesn't work quite right. So let's look at today's text together. Our text comes from the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet to the Israelite people during their time of exile. The Israelite people were God's people. And as you might know, they loved God and they walked with God, but inevitably they would turn their heart from God. They would do their own thing and yet God would forgive them. And this cycle repeated time and time again. And God used the prophet Ezekiel to speak the words of truth to the Israelite people. And these truths are still valid for us today. We're picking up the story in Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. It says here, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and all your idols, I will cleanse you. 
Talk about a messy state to be found in. The Israelite people had become a scattered people and an exiled people. And during their time away, they had forgotten their own land. The people, their customs, they had adapted to new ways of living. They had taken to new customs. They had changed. They had forgotten where they had come from and who they once were. They had left behind the things that had mattered to them at one point in their lives. During their time away from their land, the Israelite people had taken to new idols and new gods, sometimes out of a means of survival. Other things had become more important to them than God. And he saw this, and he knew that he would need to take action. He says, I will take you from the nations and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle you with clean water and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you. And he goes on to recognize that it isn't just an exterior condition. And this is where it gets serious. You see, if we stop and we sit and we get still, we're doing all of these things, and, and these are all exterior behaviors, but they're helping us address the more serious interior conditions. And that's what God wants to address in verse 26. It says here in Ezekiel 26, a new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. The Israel people, like you and I, had developed a heart condition. They had developed a, let's call it a, a heart of stone. They had been faced with loss eviction from their home, their land, and now they were foreigners living in a strange place. They had suffered life as outcasts. They had lost their livelihoods, their identities. They had forgotten who their God was and they had forgotten who they were. They had gotten so entrenched in their new world and their new surroundings and had given over to their new life, sometimes just to survive, that their hearts had become like stone no longer working quite right. Things that wound our hearts come to us not only from the outside, but they can also come from our own choices. Yes, offense will come at us and from different people and at different stages, but sometimes the offenses that seem to have the biggest impact in us are the offenses that come from within us, from our own choices. Why? because that's when we have to face the reality that we made those choices. You see, like the Israelites, the things that have happened to us will always happen to us. But as Pastor Josh talked about last week, what we do in response to those things is up to us. Are we gonna get bitter or are we gonna get better? When we, like the Israelites, get bitter, or when we turn our backs on God, our hearts begin to harden ever so slightly. Paul says it like this in the book of Romans in the first chapter in verse 21 when he says this, For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Before every man there stands an open choice, and it has to be so. Without choice there can be no goodness, and without choice there can be no love. A persuaded goodness is not real goodness, and a persuaded love is not love at all. You see, the toner maiden note is not condemnation and not judgment, but wistful sorrow, full regret. It describes exactly the feeling of a father when he saw his son turn his back on his home and go out to the far country. Think of the pain, the sorrow, the hurt. Hearts that have for the most part been hurt multiple times have the tendency to grow numb and will develop what we know to be true, which is a stone-like affect that will slowly become impenetrable. This is a defense mechanism that people develop for their safety. They're tired of getting hurt, tear after tear and cry after cry, moaning after moaning. I'm not gonna take it any longer. And so they begin to allow their hearts to become as hard as rock stoned, calloused, and dead. And so, this is the danger that lies within us all. The danger that we face, the reality that we have the ability 
to shift this heart of flesh into a heart of stone because of an offense, a word, a disgust, a bitterness, a discouragement that have directed us into a state. The heart has become cold. It refuses to love. It doesn't cry out for help. You don't need anything and certainly not God. But how many know he's not done yet? God is a good father and is just and a holy God. And even though our hearts have turned against him, how many know he doesn't turn his heart from us? Instead, he sends us his son. What does God have to do? But he has an operation to do. God has an operation to do. We have famous physicians all around the world. Many doctors have performed surgeries that were impossible. Many have been applauded for these surgeons, but no surgeon has ever done what Jesus has done. If our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent an educator. I promise you. If our greatest need had been for technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been for money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been for pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was for forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. You see, you and I need a savior. The savior Jesus Christ, we are desperate in need of forgiveness. We are desperate for his forgiveness and only when we can embrace his forgiveness, only then are we able to live again but we are going to need to do some things here. We're gonna to need to deal with some of the issues. We're gonna to need to lay down our hearts at the altar. Let us think of the procedure of heart surgery for a moment, shall we? You see, heart surgery is performed because there's an artery blockage. They don't just decide to do a heart surgery. They determine this with a series of tests and blood work and x-rays and EKGs and stress tests. Now, how many of you know you don't need any more stress? But when we look at this in the spiritual aspect, God also examines our hearts and notices that there are some procedures he needs to perform because there are some things that are blocking the passage, the way to our heart. It could be unforgiveness, could be rejection and bitterness, hatred, anxiety, unbelief, betrayal, anger, rage, adultery. You and God are the only ones who know that, but he needs to operate. He wants to clear a passage. The question is, will you surrender? Will you lay it all down and allow him to remove the blockages that have hardened your heart of stone and replace it with a new one? Will you decide to say, God, here is my pain and here is my sorrow. Here is my unbelief. Here is my heart. When you decide to do that, God can begin a process to a successful surgery of the heart. And he can begin to redeem and restore the story, the stony, stony heart of yours. He will remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, one that can feel one that can love, one that can rely on him again. And when he does that, the individual will say, thank you. You can repent and you can apologize to God. You can offer yourself back to the Lord because what we needed was forgiveness. And Jesus Christ is the one that can do that. But when does he do this? When we have learned and are willing to engage in those first three boundaries, when we have learned to stop, to Sabbath, to establish a rhythm when we, where we understand that on the seventh day there is to be rest, learning to sit, to position ourselves before God, to allow him to see our hearts, to look deeply, to even ask him as David did in Psalm 139, O oh Lord, search me and know me to look directly at God, our creator, and invite him to look at what he has created, and then to be still before him, to hear from him, to receive comfort from him. Only when we are stopping, sitting, and still can God soften our hearts and switch our hearts of stone. 
Then God will have the time and space to change our hearts to hearts of flesh. Then God will be able to soften the heart that is becoming hardened. Then God will be able to remove the clogged, diseased, wounded portions of the heart he so longs to have beating fully. In our opening illustration, we have a miracle that took place as a doctor speaks to his patient after heart surgery and whispers in her ear, tell your heart to beat again. And as it is recorded, the heart begins to beat again. How wonderful God is to whisper in our ear and assure us that we can tell our hearts to beat again. As this takes place, God will continue to minister to us and through us. With this new heart he has given us, he begins to write his truth on our hearts and we become the living vessels of a wonderful work of God. The last two verses of our text read like this. In verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. These two verses to the Israelite people were the best news. The spirit of God in them causing them to be able to walk in God's statutes and obey his rules would be wonderful, but more wonderful than that would be the gift of land and identity. God was promising them life through the gift of land and a forever identity as his people. And these are the very same promises that he still offers to us today as his children. That when he softens our hearts, we will know him better, love him deeper, we will be his people and he will be our God. Paul, in his letter to the church at Corinth, reminds them of this connection to God in this way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered to us, written not in ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. This is the good news, that God can change you because he has changed your heart through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is going to be the story of your lifetime. Tell your heart to beat again. The change in your character, the change in your life is only the commendation that others need to see. This is the great claim. Every one of us is a letter of Christ. The testimony of what God gets to do. Long ago, Plato said that the good teacher does not write his message in ink that will fade, but he writes it upon men. God makes promises and he keeps them. And that is just what Jesus has done. He has written a message and he has redeemed us, not with fading ink, but with the spirit that lives within us. There is a great truth here, which is at once an inspiration and an awful warning. Every man is an open letter from Jesus Christ. Every Christian, whether we like it or not, is an advertisement for Christianity. The honor of Christ is in the hands of his followers. We judge a shopkeeper by the kinds of goods he sells. We judge a craftsman by the kinds of articles they produce. We judge a church by the kind of people they create. And therefore men judge a God by his followers. You see, this heart has been touched by God and it's gonna be a testimony of the very love of a father to his child. And now that God wants to give you a renewed, pliable, submissive heart, now he has replaced with it a new one. There's a need to tell your heart to beat again. When your heart starts to skip a beat or when your heart starts to get clogged, it's time to slow down. It's time to sit, to be still. About six days from now, enough of your life will have impacted your heart. You'll need a break. How will you respond? Will you push through, test the limits and see how far you can take it? Or will you stop, sit and be still and allow God to once again soften your heart, to flush out all that has clogged the arteries? You see, if we can get into a really good rhythm of doing it regularly and keeping these boundaries, then guess what? We're not going to need massive open heart surgery that will require months of rehab. 
No, God wants us to live within these boundaries of stopping, sitting, and being still and having our hearts softened regularly because then we can live with the fullness that God intends for us to experience. But if God has to keep sidelining us to do heart transplants, which he will because he loves us, then that rehab is going to keep us down for recovery time. It's going to take us a while to get back on our feet. Ask anyone who's gone through heart surgery. It takes a while. However, if we can make the time daily, weekly for these rhythms and these boundaries, then there is a fullness of life that we get to experience that is just incredible. Our lives have more space for the people and the things that we love. Our bodies are ready to experience new and exciting things because they are rested and our minds are in the right place and our relationships are healthier and our hearts are ready to engage all that is there for us to engage. My friends, you see, this is what God has in store for us. God gives us boundaries not to limit us or inhibit us but because he has for us a full life to live. He wants us to learn to stop, to sit, to be still, so that in the end, he can soften our hearts and he can change our hearts of stone for a heart of flesh and soften us. Would you pray with me today? Father Almighty God, we thank you we thank you that you are kind enough in your forethought to give us these boundaries, to plan for us a regular schedule of maintenance to keep us living the fullest life that you have for us. God, we long to live lives that are full, to have relationships that are healthy, marriages that are vibrant, families that are whole. And Lord God, may we be people who learn to stop, sit, be still, and receive a softened heart. May we be willing to participate with you in all that we can do Lord, we thank you, and we are so grateful for you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. i
Oh, man. 